Good evening, everyone. Thanks for inviting us to talk about our program, the Chariot program, um, that is focused on um, improving the pediatric patient experience through these emerging technologies. So and here we are looking, Mary, uh, Molly and me, we are presenting this. So Mighty Immersion is like a look company and we collaborate with us in the Chariot program. So the Chariot program started like three years ago and it was funded by two pediatric anesthesiologists, Dr. Samuel Rodriguez and Dr. Tomas Caruso that they realize that almost all the kids that go to the hospitals or go to the doctor, they are scared. Sometimes because it's new and they don't know where they're going, and other times because they have like a previous bad experience. So they want to solve this problem. And what's, what's important about solving this problem, like addressing the anxiety and the fear of the kids in the hospital? So fear and anxiety has been um, associated with nightmares, sleep disturbance, negative behavioral changes, increased pain, some regression of the development of millstones, and of course, an obvious that they have fear to go back to the hospital. So here we are that we need to solve this, and we want to change this crying and scared face into smiling faces. So Chariot stays for childhood anxiety reduction through innovation and technology. And here we need to add pain and fear, and not only anxiety. The Chariot uh, program tries to engage all the kids into imagination play and draws their attention from these uncomfortable stimulus. Uh, through Chariot, Lucille Packard, uh, is uh, emerging like a national leader in providing these tools to the patient and improve this patient experience. The goal of our program, the Chariot program, is bringing these emerging technologies to all the hospitals and trying to find the best way that these kids don't have fear and have their best experience in a hospital setting. So as Victoria just introduced us, there is a lot of um, many components of the chariot program. And here, Luke, Molly, and I are coming on behalf of the chariots program. As um, Victoria told you, I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist from Spain, relocated here. And, I'm, and they give me the opportunity to join this amazing program. And I'm super happy to have the kids around. And then Molly and Luke will talk a little bit more. So the chariot programs start to work in and they need to build like a toolbox. Is this is called last the emerging technologies. And we have projectors, mobile VR headsets, augmented reality, and the last one that we integrated in our toolbox is this room scale VR that we will explain later that we use for physical therapies. And the difference because we have hand and feet controllers. And now Molly, our child life specialist, is going to explain each tool to you. I'm Molly. I work with child life. Could I get a feel? How many people actually know what a child life specialist is? No idea. That's perfectly fine. Most people don't, so I have no offense to that. Um, so child life is part of the, our hospital team that really helps normalize and familiarize the hospital experience for children and their families. Um, like Victoria was explaining, we help explain why they're there in an age-appropriate manner um, so they can better understand why they're there, that they didn't do something wrong, um, causing them to be there. Um, for younger kids, that's a big misconception um, that they sometimes think. Um, and helping them get through those scary experiences by creating coping plans and helping them through and still allowing them to still be a child while they're in the hospital. Um, and so the Chariot program has incorporated child life because we are often the ones uh, incorporating it into our daily interventions with our work with the children. So the first item in our toolbox is BERT, our projector system, which stands for Bedside Entertainment Relaxation Theater. And this really shines with younger kids. So it's made of three parts. So you have the projector itself in the back with a special customized uh, casing that can clamp to the back of the bed. 
And then in the front of the bed, you have the screen, which is about a two foot by three foot screen that is clamped to the front of the bed. And so I primarily work in the surgery center where Chariot first kind of started and piloted its program. Um, so we really use this because most younger kids, their main stressors are separating from parents when it's time to go back into the operating room um, to limit infections and just other external bacteria going into the operating rooms. Most of the time, parents aren't going back there with their child. Um, so that can be a big stressor. And the second stressor can be the mask induction itself. So with the projector and today's society, kids really engage in technology. They're glued to the TV or their personal tablet. And we are kind of captivating that by putting a big screen in front of their face. And so with this, a lot of times when kids are really distracted by a game or a video from YouTube or Netflix, um, we have been decreasing the amount of relaxation medicine that we've been using to help with that separation, but now we can use distraction with videos to kind of help ease that transition and limiting the amount of medication that we're actually needing to give our patients. The second great thing about the screen is it helps as a barrier. It blocks a lot of the kids' like view sight um, so blocking some of the machines in the operating room and some of the external things that they don't know, which are scary to them. Um, and then once they're in the room, they flip over one of the big OR lights and then still project whatever they're watching onto that. So they can watch it the whole entire time as they're falling asleep. For the kids who are really anxious about the mask induction itself, we use our friend Stevo the Dragon he is one of our game tools to help make the mask fun. So the kid gets to pick the color of their dragon, green, red, or green, green, red, or blue, and then they get to choose what does their dragon eat? Do they want cake? Do they want tacos? Or do they want a pizza? And so we imagine that the mask is that trigger to make the dragon blow fire, to heat up their food before they can eat it. So we encourage them to roar as loud as they can through that mask so they can heat up their food before they can eat it. And then once their food is all heated up, we tell them to make their yummy noises as they eat their food. But the only way they can breathe the fire is if that anesthesia mask is over their face where it's going to be for the anesthesia induction. So we practice with that. It's fun, exciting, they're laughing. And then when we're doing it for the actual anesthesia, it's not scary anymore. It's fun, it's a game. And so it's really changed the difference, um, especially from kids that's like three to five, three to six range. And it's really cool and exciting. And kids get so excited and they'll come back and be like, can I play with Sivo? Can I play with the dragon again? And they get really, really excited. So you can see as the dragon is heating up its food. And so you can kind of manually do it where it's a roar, you can hit it to make it go, or you can make it um, have a voice command. So every time they say tacos or they roar, it will, the projector itself will pick up that sound and make them eat it. So then the next tool on our toolbox would be our virtual reality goggles. So virtual reality is a headset typically with a phone. Now there's newer versions that you don't even need a phone. Um, but you put it on and you enter this 360 degree, ex degree experience. You can be flying in the sky, swimming with dolphins, or being in a very calm environment, just practicing on your breathing. But you are fully emerged in this alternate reality. And so for kids, sometimes this is really helpful to temporarily escape the stressors of the hospital. Um, so this really works best for kids over the age of 10. However, we have used it as young as age five for short amounts of time. Um, and so I wanted to see how many here, if you guys need to have a procedure or just like a blood draw, 
an IV or a vaccination, who gets anxious? There's a couple of you. I know I do too. Um, and so which of you, some people, the way they help cope through things that they're really stressful for these things is they need to know everything that's happening. They need to watch everything. They want to know everything that's happening. It kind of makes them feel a little bit more in control. The other people kind of feel they want to know very little information or no information at all, and they want something else to focus on. They're like, I know this is happening, but I don't really want to know. So I'm going to focus on something over there or something. So we are using virtual reality as that way to kind of get them out of that experience. Um, and so they can go flying, be a penguin, um, go swimming with dolphins. And it's really exciting because then they could have focused on something different. And that's when virtual reality really shines. And so most of the time, virtual reality started in the surgery center, like I said. We were basically using it mostly for IV starts, occasionally to help with the anesthesia induction itself. Um, as we just kind of develop what our protocol is, figuring out who does it work for, who doesn't it work for. Um, but since then, within the last year, all of the child life specialists on all of our inpatient units have access to it. So all of acute care, all of intensive care units have it. Um, all the outpatient centers that are connected to the main Lucille Packard Hospital, so emergency department, surgery center, radiology, our dialysis clinic, outpatient hematology, oncology, all has access to it. And then, so within the last year, it's been using with our vascular access team, helping with wound care, um, really painful dressings where some of the patients don't want to see what those wounds look like. They get to focus on something else during those. Um, some minor procedures that you may use a sedation for or some that we used to use anesthesia for, we can now just use with virtual reality. One of those examples is for um, one of our hormone implants, it's just a very um, simple implant that goes right under the skin. We used to do all of those under general anesthesia, so the kid is completely asleep. Now it's become the no, new standard that those are being done with just some local lidocaine and virtual reality goggles. So they're not getting any type of sedation whatsoever. So they're in, they get it done, and they walk out of the hospital 10 minutes later. Um, so that's been one of our biggest accomplishments in the last year. Um, they can help with lumbar punctures and all sorts of different things. Um, it helps with relaxation. Kids who have been in the hospitals for a really long time just helps them forget and kind of go explore different parts of the world um, and just kind of get somewhere outside of their hospital bedroom. Um, and so on the video to the, le to the right, um, I want to let you kind of see this guy's experience and you can kind of see how it's helping him get through one of his wound dressing changes. So this patient originally wouldn't let anyone come near his arm. You couldn't even look at it without him getting super anxious and trying to resist the treatment. But over time, reusing virtual reality for each of his dressing changes, he stopped being anxious about it. He knew that he could focus on something different and he could get through it with, with no trouble at all. The next video is an example of one of those hormone implants being placed. And so she, I believe, is about six, maybe seven years old. Um, 
And I know if I was six or seven, I would be pretty anxious if somebody's making a small incision into my body while I'm awake. So the fact that we are now able to do this on a standard without any sedation whatsoever is pretty remarkable. And some other examples, on a daily basis, I'm using this for IV starts, especially when it is partnered with some sort of numbing agent. There are several younger kids, teenagers, who said they barely even feel it. And IV was the biggest stressor of their day. And they're like, oh, I didn't feel it at all. You're done? Or, oh, I just felt like a little pinch. That wasn't bad. Um, another kid who's five years old, he's come in for so many cardiac casts that it became a very stressful experience. It was hard for mom to get him even into the hospital. And he has an allergic reaction to our relaxation medicine. We've tried having mom present for induction and that actually increased his behavior and made it worse. So we had to kind of team up with the anesthesiologist to try to figure out what was the best way to make us get to the patient to the cardiac cath lab safely and to make this as least stressful for him because we can't give him any medicine to help calm him down ahead of time. And so he was really into like the TV. He was playing on his tablet in the room. So what we did is we used our tablet all the way to the room because sometimes using virtual reality goggles during transportation can really increase the risk of somebody coming really nauseous, which is not what we want. Um, so we used a tablet games on the way to the room. And then once we got to the sterile doors, we put on the goggles. And I forget, I think he was playing Pebbles the Penguin. And he just sat up and he's playing, and he's getting so into it. Good thing we have rails on our beds because he probably would have gone right off. He was so into his game that he never noticed the mask coming near his face. And that was also a big stressor. He would not let anyone go near him with the mask, even though it was for a play reason. Um, but he had no idea. And his mom was so thrilled afterwards. He came back like a month later. She's like, we're going to do the exact same thing. That was amazing. And we did. And now he didn't really have any stress or anxiety coming to the hospital for his procedures. And so it really has changed the patient's experience, what they thought was super stressful and caused a lot of anxiety. They have found a tool that has now allowed them to get through those. However, virtual reality isn't for everyone. Um, before I go into a room as I'm trying to help with a coping plan, usually if they're going for a procedure, I ask, the question, do you want to watch, do you want that control, or do you want to be distracted? If they want that control, great. This isn't for you. I will still offer it for some teams, but most of the time they'll deny it because they want to know what's happening. And sometimes when they do try it, you've seen that it will actually increase their anxiety because it, they're taking away that control piece that they feel that they have while they're watching. Um, typically with seizures, I don't usually mess with unless it's been several, several years since they've had a seizure. Um, just from studies from the virtual reality companies, there has been a history or an increased risk of seizures occurring during it, only if they have that history. Um, so do they have headaches, migraines, frequent uh, car sickness, motion sickness? Uh, older kids will dive a little bit more deeper into it. Is it just on long car rides? Is it every ride? Um, is it only certain things that trigger a headache? For teens, they'll be like, hey, this can happen. Do you want to use it? Do you want to take the risk that they're, you possibly might get a headache from this? Younger kids, I feel like they don't have the vocabulary or the self-awareness of their bodies yet to indicate if they're playing a game like, you know, this is kind of making me feel a little uncomfortable. My tummy feels a little weird. Um, so I usually don't, won't offer it for younger kids if they indicate one of these things versus older kids would be like, hey, this could happen. You have the self-awareness that if you're starting to get a headache, we can take it off. And so then I usually do a trial period before that procedure is happening to make sure it's a good fit. And then we're not in the middle of the procedure and they're like, I'm super nauseous. Um, but it can increase anxiety. We also document all this. So a lot of our research is pulled from these notes on how often is it being used. Did one of those, these things happen after the use of it? 
Um, and what was kind of their, how receptive were they to it? How did, were they super engaged? Did they like it? Did they not like it? Um, and so that's just kind of how we're using and implementing and we're excited to see what more we can achieve with it. Ah, sorry. Okay. Cool. Nice. Hey everyone. My name's Luke. Um, so I work with wonderful people like Molly and Maria on more of the technical side of things. I help develop a lot of the tools that we're working with. Um, I also help distribute the tools that we build to other hospitals around the country. Um, so briefly, I kind of want to talk about how we got into actually creating our own content um, and realizing how we could really take advantage of these tools uh, if we could start altering them and making them a little bit better for our use cases. So when, when we first got started, uh, we began implementing these tools using commercially available tools and content. Um, so games that anyone can, can download and use if you, if you have the, the hardware. Um, we found out that you know, virtual reality had huge benefits inside of the hospital, as you heard from Molly, um, but we also found that there were kind of unique needs that, that weren't being met by, by the content and, and the tools that were already out there. So uh, we, we decided to start building our own games and uh, our own virtual reality content to, to meet those needs. Um, so some of the games that we've made so far are Space Burgers, Pebbles the Penguin, and Space Pups. Um, and I can show some videos of, of some of this content later, but um, I'll tell a little bit, talk a little bit about what these unique needs are for the hospital and, and why we needed to end up building uh, our own custom tools. So the biggest thing about when, when introducing virtual reality into, into the healthcare space and the clinical space is uh, it needs to be easy to use. It needs to be easy to use for the patients and it needs to be easy to use for the providers. Because uh, there is a lot going on in the hospital and playing VR is not necessarily the top priority for anyone. Um, so it has a lot of benefits, but we, we definitely need to make sure that it is it is seamless process. Um, so number one, in terms of easy to use, it, we can't have a child life specialist or, or another medical provider troubleshooting with a patient next to their bed. Um, it's, it's really key to remember that once someone is inside this VR headset, we have no clue what they're seeing and what's going on, um, which makes it really hard to, to help fix things when they go wrong. Um, and you guys saw pictures, but this is what a VR headset looks like. So, you know, I could have this thing on and be in a completely different world, and you have no clue what I'm looking at. And if you're a six-year-old and you've run into a problem, like you're stuck in some menu, uh, there's really no way for us to help you get through that situation unless we take off the headset and get through it, um, which just makes things really tricky. So what we ended up doing is, is building our own content to make it as easy to use VR as possible. Um, that was a key driver of, of needing to build our own stuff. Um, following like right behind that is the games that we want to want our patients to be playing, we don't want them to ever end. Uh, that's because we never know how long a procedure is going to last. So we might have a procedure, uh, you know, an IV can last anywhere from a couple minutes to 15 minutes and we need to make sure that uh, the patient is engaged and distracted the entire time. We also don't want the patient to get poked right as they lose in the game or, you know, essentially Add, add insult to injury of, of what's going on. Um, so the content itself, we want to make sure is always positive and, and there's no way for, for a patient to lose. Um, instead, we're, we're just constantly giving them more. They're just winning and it's co constant positive reinforcement. Um, that kind of follows in, in the do no harm category in that our patients, we want to make sure uh, they're having fun the whole time. They're not getting frustrated while in this game. Uh, the last thing we're trying to do is add add more negative uh, feelings to their hospital experience. Um, and we also want to make sure that the content is just appropriate for all ages. You know, we have six-year-olds playing this content. We can't have them shooting zombies and things like that in a hospital. Um, so all of our content is very lighthearted. Uh, and, and we try to, you know, also include kind of uh, subliminal positive reinforcement messages all throughout the content that we develop. Um, as we started spreading throughout the hospital. We started in, in the surgical center uh, with, in, in pre-op and post-op. Um, as we started spreading to other units, we began finding some other needs that were, that were pretty key for the content. A big one that we constantly hear feedback on now, how useful it is, is, is to make this content reorientable. 
Uh, and that doesn't mean much unless you've put VR on, but most VR content is meant to be played while sitting up. And if you lie back down and are playing VR, it, it, it just won't work. Um, imagine you know, looking at, at the, the horizon line playing a game. If you were to look up, you'd just be looking at the sky. So you wouldn't actually be enjoying your VR experience. Um, but in the hospital, patients are lying down for most of the procedures that they uh, have to go through. So having the content allow you to be, be able to be played while in any orientation is actually really important uh, for the accessibility and the usefulness across many different patient populations. The final, uh, another great thing that we've added is the ability to increase the cognitive load, which we call mighty mode. Um, so when a patient is inside of VR, uh, a child life specialist is still very much a part of the process and, and part of the experience because um, the patient, you know, they can be engaged in VR, but the second something spooky happens outside, they're going to be focusing on what's happening uh, outside, like the, like the people walking around them or the person that's touching their arm. Um, and it's really important to keep them engaged uh, in this distraction. We think of, a, of attention as a limited resource. And a lot of the negative feelings that you feel is, is amplified when you start focusing on them. So if we can focus your attention elsewhere, that's where these distraction tools are really doing well and, and doing their job. So child life specialists, it's, it's, they constantly are keeping patients re-engaged in their content. Um, and that goes beyond virtual reality, whether it's the BERT or iPads or bubbles. Um, so in Mighty, the, the Mighty mode that we've developed for these VR tools actually makes the game a little bit more intense and adds an instantaneous change to the content, which makes that content just a little bit more interesting during that 15 seconds that we need them to be focused really intently on the content. So you might be having an IV poke, and right when the needle is about to get, well, right when you're about to get poked, will make the game a little bit more fun, the visuals will start getting a little bit more colorful, the audio might get louder, and that just makes, makes all the stimulus kind of drown out the needle poke. Um, and the final thing that we, is really important for us is our, our games can be played uh, with only head movement, um, and they can also be played with only hands. So this depends on the procedure, but in the ears, nose, and throat clinic, you don't want a patient moving their head while they're getting a uh, nasal endoscopy. Uh, so we'll have it so that the game can be played with just their hands. Um, but if you're getting an IV or you're having your right hand, um, you know, a dressing change on your right hand, you don't want that arm moving at all. So you'll have it so that they can play these games with just their head. So being able to toggle this, these control mechanisms back and forth is really important so that we're, we're making this stuff useful for as many patients as possible. All right. Okay, so I'll show you a quick video of what Pebbles the Penguin looks like. This is one of our first VR uh, games. Nice. Thanks, Molly. So in this game, um, patients play as a penguin, and they're sliding down a mountain, and they need to collect pebbles. Uh, in this mode, you're steering by turning your head left and right. We've made sure that these games are as comfortable as possible. That's another key one we didn't uh, mention, but VR can bring up like motion sickness. So these games, there's, there's a couple key elements inside them that make them as comfortable as possible. So you'll see it looks kind of slow, but once you're in VR, it's, it's, it's about as intense as you want it to be. Um, so fun things are constantly happening. As you collect points, you unlock things. Um, the more you unlock, the more, the more flowers that are popping up all over the world. Um, constantly promoting this idea of, of growth and, and, and life and you being the character that's making this all happen. Again, new things always happening. So when, the second you're flying over the mountains, which happens about three minutes into gameplay, you're immediately really excited about what's happening. And this is the mighty mode or groovy mode. So the music changes, the colors start changing, pebbles start shooting all over the place. Uh, Patients are immediately back into the game. You can ask them how many pebbles they have or how many points they have, and, and they'll be really excited to tell you that they have you know, 600 points. Cool. What's your password? 
Um, yeah, I think you have to click next just for this one. Cool. Thanks. Um, excellent. So beyond games, you know, interactive content is, is great for distraction because it requires a little bit of, of actual engagement. Uh, but sometimes just the ability to sit back, relax, and enjoy a passive experience is really beneficial in the hospital um, for a number of different things. So, so one of the pieces of content that we made uh, in the last year is this mindful Aurora. Um, and this is a, a guided meditation mindfulness experience. So the patient is transported to a, a meadow, and for about 10 minutes, they listen to a nice calming script, walking them through breathing exercises and watching the day transfer from day to sunset to night. Um, throughout the experience, there are breathing cues that ha help patients kind of breathe at a regular pace, uh, which is really important for, for managing your own pain and your anxiety. Um, we're, all of these tools that we build are, are backed by, by studies that we're constantly running. So this was run on, on a, first on a GI chronic pain population that is still ongoing. Um, and we also created a Spanish translation of it and are using it for limited English proficiency parents. So we actually have parents, when, when parents get separated from their, patient, from their kids uh, as they're going to the operating room, the parents get extremely anxious as well. Um, particularly when they, they speak Spanish and they, they don't know English well and most of the hospital staff is, is not able to comfort them the way they, they necessarily need to. Um, so being able to ha focus on that population and, and bring tools like this to them has been a, a cool study that we've been doing and working on. Um, so right as they're separated, they, they get to enjoy this mindfulness experience and, and helps, helps relax them just, just a little bit. Um, and, and the other experience that we're working on is under COB. This is a snorkeling experience that's meant to be used by women in labor, uh, particularly when they're getting an epidural placed. So it's a snorkeling experience because it's, it's meant to be played while looking down, which is the position that, that you're in when you get an epidural placed. Um, so you're looking down at, at various uh, underwater scenes and able to relax and be calmed uh, while you're having the, about the 10, 15 minute procedure of having an epidural placed. Um, so games, passive experiences, you know, we try to build as much content for, for the many different use cases that we find in the hospital. Uh, and our ability to create our own custom content has really allowed us to hit as many different patients as possible and, and bring these tools to many different departments. Um, the final thing of, of, of kind of creating custom stuff uh, is, is less about the content, a little bit more about the tools. Um, again, our number one need is, is to have easy to use tools. Uh, so we, we've actually had to build kind of our own operating system, which overrides some of these consumer focused stuff and makes it really easy for patients and providers alike to find their content and launch it and get it up and running. You know, VR has been used inside of healthcare for about 20 years. Um, but only recently was it, was it something that could actually be clinically viable. Um, so research was done 20 years ago using these massive rigs that were stationary inside of, uh, inside of one room in a hospital. Um, but you can imagine that's not really scalable for real clinical applications. Um, but now we've gotten to the point where we're able to make this easy enough to use where anyone in the hospital can start using this tool. Um, so we, we were measuring, you know, how long does it take to set up and how long does it take to get patients inside of this rig, inside of these headsets, you know, and that's, that's slowly gone from 30 minutes to five minutes and now we're just down to seconds. Um, and other tools, you know, just minimizing the, the IT needs. We have 50 devices throughout Stanford Hospital right now um, and keeping all those devices up and running actually takes a, a fair amount of effort. So we've, those are some of the challenges that a little less fun to talk about, but are actually super crucial to bring these tools to life inside of a clinical uh, setting. And the final one is extremely important is infection control compliancy. All of our headsets are completely wipeable, and that has actually required a lot of our own custom development. We've been manufacturing our own parts so that these headsets can be wipeable uh, and, and usable throughout the hospital. Okay. So all of this custom development has allowed us to really grow within the hospital. 
Uh, starting in, in, in surgery, we, we've quickly expanded to ENT, allergy, emergency department's a big one, uh, family medicine where patients are going through small procedures and shots and immunizations. Um, really, it's, 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 it's really fun when you start bringing these tools to new departments in the hospital because you immediately get these really excited uh, medical teams coming up with all these different use cases you haven't thought of. Uh, and, and they start, they don't jump on board and now you have a whole new cohort of, of the medical team who is who's ready to start experimenting and, and bringing this new exciting tool to their patients. Uh, and the ability to create our own custom content and, and all these custom tools has made that expansion a lot easier. And we've also began to grow outside of Lucille Packard. So as, as we've gone to conferences uh, and the Chariot team has started to share all the great work we've been up to, we start having a lot of other important hospitals uh, throughout the country reaching out to us wanting to start their own programs. So throughout 2018, we, we made our own kit, which was an all-in-one package that could start bringing these tools to other hospitals. Uh, and it made, made, we have a lot of you know, friends up in San Francisco using this at Benioff Children's. Uh, Colorado uses a lot of VR headsets. They've probably got 30 plus at this point. Um, Minnesota Children's, Texas Children's, Connecticut Children's, all of these hospitals across the country are using uh, the content and, and the headset hardware that we've developed here at Lucille Packard. And now, through all that great work and the spread of, of what we've been developing, we've actually partnered with a, a nonprofit organization called Starlight Children's Foundation that is bringing this expansion of our tools to another level. Um, so starting just a couple weeks ago, they've been delivering these other kits that we helped them build. Uh, for free, and these kits are now in over 200 hospitals across the United States. Um, so the tools that started here at the Chariot Program have, have gone far and wide in just a few years. So the, the research and development doesn't stop at VR with the Chariot Program, and we're constantly doing new stuff. Uh, you know, our, our end goal is, is to reach as many patients as possible and improve that patient experience and make the hospital a less, a less scary place. Um, so we are, we're constantly trying to look for, for new ways to do that. And one of the most recent things that we're experimenting with is augmented reality. Um, you may have heard about AR in the news. Um, the, the difference between AR and VR is that AR is kind of like uh, you, it's essentially like putting holograms. You wear this screen, uh, you wear a headset, but you're able to see the real world, and then you have kind of a digital overlay. Um, what's particularly useful about that in, in the clinical space is that you don't completely block out vision. So for patients who are particularly interested in looking at the IV when it's being placed, or they need to be able to see their parents, um, this allows them to still get a lot of the benefits of distraction, but still be able to see what's going on outside. Because um, sometimes being cut off can really increase the anxiety rather than reduce it. Um, so augmented reality is, is a new place that we are starting to experiment with. And I think we have a video uh, that shows one of our patients using this AR headset. You can see the goggles that he's looking through are clear. So he can kind of see, he can see this hologram type stuff and also see the world around him. And he was pretty stoked about it. Another nice thing about the AR headset is you're able to fit an indus induction mask a little bit easier than you can with a VR headset. It doesn't stop us with VR, um, but the AR headset is, does have a little bit more real estate for that mask. Excellent. Cool. Um, and one of the final things that we are experimenting with and, and are really excited about uh, is this hardware called the Vive, or, or room scale VR. Um, so these VR headsets that we've been talking about so far are, are mobile headsets and just are put on the head. This other headset that we're experimenting with now has hand controllers so that you can actually grab things in the virtual world and it can track where your hands are and it can track where your feet are. 
And this has potentially fantastic applications in, in physical therapy and pain rehab, actually gamifying these processes that are, are painful. Um, so, you know, patients are standing and kicking things and doing things they wouldn't want to do otherwise because they're just so engaged having fun inside of VR. And I'll have Maria talk a little bit more about that. Yes, we are running behind. So this is our, like, last new program, and I'm pretty excited. Also, it's like I'm very involved because the other ones, almost everyone can use it. This is a little bit more complex. So we need to be there and we need to engage the patient and make like the species safe. This is a uh, one we have, we are like um, collaborating with a um, pain rehabilitation program in Middlefield. So we have a special room to do that. But also I'm doing in the patients program in Lucille Packard. So it's like amazing going to a room and see how a patient that is like in bed and doesn't want to get up, you just give the VR headset and start moving around without any complaint about pain or discomfort. So it's amazing because we have like a lot of oncology patients that are depressed or weak, and with this kind of tools, at least we can give them this ability. And the last thing that we want to say is that we are doing research. The research is a very valuable tool for us because helps us to create better content and also to get an idea how we can improve this experience. All the feedback that the patients give to us help us to think what is our next step. Is the reason that now we are using a lot of augmented reality because we realize that some patient doesn't want to be locked inside or they get nausea or something. So we start looking at that. And there's a lot of studies, and the only one that we just already finished is the vascular access study. We enroll like 300 patients, and we randomize them into projectors, virtual reality, or standard of care that is like nothing. And the outcome is like we have like significant reduction in fear. So that was great for us, and we are running all those studies. And this is the outcome, so the emerging technologies we have realized that it's a positive experience. We say that because we run surveys to the patients, to the parents, to the clinicians, and all seems like be very happy to use these tools. And the other thing is like uh, we thought that all these emerging technologies, just projectors, a, uh, augmented reality or virtual reality, can work like a strong non-pharmacology tool to help the experience of these patients. And so as we start, emerging technologies can improve the patient experience. And that's all. Thank you for sharing this evening with us. And we are happy to respond to any questions that you may have to ask. So we don't have a microphone to pass around. We do ask if you do have a question to speak up for us. Yeah. Oh, okay. You're gonna, okay. Just so. in case someone okay, wants yeah. to go with sure, yeah, no. yeah. you. Sure, yeah. You know better. Go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> don't yeah. be upset if I don't get your number. <laughs> <laughs> this? <laughs> eight, three, eight, two, eight, five, eight. Again? <laughs> <laughs> no one? Is that you? In the back? Okay. Yeah. 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 to use outside vendors to develop your library of applications? Or do you have a sense of how big the library has to be? Mm. Hopefully children are repeating operations that frequently. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I can talk about yeah, that one. Kind of, uh, yeah. Use this for the yeah. video. Um, yeah, the, the question was, do we feel the need to use third party vendors to kind of increase the size of our library? Uh, you know, how much, con how much different content do we need for all the different patients that we see? Um, I think we are definitely looking to outside vendors because there's only a few tweet. you know, we see a lot of content that if we could tweak it just a little bit, uh, we could make that just as valuable as our own custom content. Um, we've actually done that for one piece of content so far, uh, and we, we use that all the time. Um, I think our library, 
you know, ideally, yes, we, we could really expand the library of content quickly with, with other people. Um, I'm hopeful that this space of, of just using VR in, in pediatric healthcare is growing, and I think there's a lot of different vendors who are actually creating content specific to this stuff. Um, so as we find content that fits for us, we absolutely will be using third-party content. And you have standards so they know what to develop to. Exactly so right. Yep, yep, exactly. Um, yeah, you know, we have, we have design standards, you know, design constraints that we're, we're pretty keen on and that we think are, are really important to make sure that these experiences are, are good for all of our patients. Um, and in the end, you, you, you know, there's so many different patients, people are interested in so many different things, and if you can find the right content for the right patient, you're going to have a way better time, and they're going to have a way better time. So it, it definitely behooves us to expand our library through as many people as possible. Um, so yeah, we absolutely use that. Yeah. So I had a hip operation at Stanford two years ago. The only distraction I got was counting back from a hundred. <laughs> for, for adults. We, Go yeah. right, yeah. Okay. So we're starting in Lucille Packard because this was created by two pediatric anesthesiologists, but we are like trying to grow up a little bit in the adult side. But all the content that we have developed till now has been like using for kids. But the last one, the mindfulness aurora, the we developed for the adult program because they are running, this is the chronic abdominal pain and there's only the adult side. And so we are trying to grow up a little bit, but also adults, I would say it's a, a little bit tricky population because sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm a kind of sample, I get like motion sickness, nausea, so kids are more appropriate for these kind of things, but for sure we, we like to use it for adults, but I think we have to build this content. So we are there and we offer for everyone. In the adult side, they have in like palliative care they are using for the chemoprophylaxis infusion and they are using for the chronic abdominal pain in the allergy clinic they're using for adults and kids, both of them. So yeah, we are happy to expand. We'll get there. <laughs> yeah. It's fascinating. Uh, are you using or are you planning to use brainwave headsets? Tan Lee's brainwave headset for eight sensors you move a cube, virtual reality, close, far, make it disappear, make the pain disappear maybe, but there's an aspect, little training and ability, not sure if it's for kids, um, to do something with VR. Andrew Junker's brainfingers.com, three sensors, you have to be chill, relaxed, you try it with Stephen Hawking, um, and uh, you can pick letters from an alphabet, no words, no language, all cool on the cusp, baby technologies, are you seeing anything like that? Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, so we're, we're starting to experiment with biofeedback a little bit. Um, and I, I call that, it kind of fits into the biofeedback world, um, maybe a little bit more on the control input side of things. But I think one thing that's really cool about brainwave reading and, and all of that is, uh, is the ability to in, empower patients to understand that um, they can take control of their own body. And I think biofeedback is particularly interesting for that. Um, you know, we measure, we measure heart rate variability, and, and that's actually a big part of uh, how calm you can be. So by showing patients that you can impact your own body and your own biofeedback, uh, you can empower them to, to kind of take control of their pain. Um, so I think brainwaves could be a really cool input mechanism for VR. It's one of those things where like, you know, how easy to use is it? I think that's a really hard thing for us. So we try to make things as simple as possible, um, but it could be something, you know, maybe a research study down the road. Uh, yeah, back, just behind you, yeah. Uh, so first of all, it's awesome what you're doing, no idea. Um, two questions. One, um, how is this being funded? Is it through Lucille Packard? And also, is the end goal to get this into a lot of hospitals and pediatrics, adults, what have you, or is it also something to become profitable that you're going to be selling it, or is it like open source to just share it? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the ch totally. Um, the, the Chariot program is, is largely funded by, by uh, donations. Um, so philanthropy is, is absolutely how we are able to, how we are able to get to where we are right now. Um, in terms of, of sharing this content out and about, um, we, I have spun off a, a small company that d does a lot of this work, takes a lot of the learnings from our work, um, and is, is, is 
delivering this content to other hospitals. Um, you know, hopefully will be profitable, but, but largely, you know, the, the goal here is to get all the great work that we've had, you know, through all these philanthropy dollars and, and being able to get it into other hospitals. Um, so I think from, from Stanford's point of view, our, our key goal is to take all of this great learning that we have and, and get it into other hospitals. Um, Starlight Children's Foundation, that whole expansion of, of content is, is not-for-profit kind of open source approach. Um, Starlight Children's is, is delivering these headsets for free to hospitals, and, and our content is, is on, those, on those headsets. So um, it's largely non-for-profit and, and donation dollars so far. So far is to survive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's to pay out. <laughs> so I just have one follow-on question. So if, if some of it is open source and somebody's delivering the headsets for free and you're distributing it to other places, then how do you make money? Is it, or you're not making money or it's, it's only the, the donations that are funding this? Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the chariot program is, is completely funded through donations. Okay. Um, yeah, my, my personal work, which started here at Chariot um, and has expanded, you know, into a for-profit company, um, is is somewhat separate. Um, I also will, you know, I continue to develop as as a profit, uh, you know, for-profit company, and, and help Chariot kind of continue to grow yeah. from there. So yeah. right now, all that we just share is yes. We just ask sometimes, now we are sharing one of our content, so we ask for donation to our like, so we can just maybe you know, pay Luke or pay another sub engineer to grow up this program, but for right now we are not asking for anything, and a lot of people ask about the software, and we just explain everything for free, maybe we shouldn't, but <laughs> it's our way. <laughs> yes, sir. Some of the content is verbal, and you this area probably has 30 or 40 different languages spoken. Mm. So how are you addressing the, uh, the language problem to get into the native language of, of your patient? Yeah. Oh, I can. Yeah, go for it. So now that we are focusing on kids, so almost all the kids that grow up here know English, and now the, the first thing that we just notice is like there is a lot of Spanish speakers and the adults, the kids, Almost all the kids that go to the hospital completely understand English, but the parents know. So it's the reason that we start translating into Spanish. So probably the next steps is gonna go to Chinese or whatever. So it's just we can use the same content. The only thing is like changing the voice. I understand for children, but the parents. Yeah. Are the parents to explain the content, or what do you mean? Uh, you were talking about potentially using this for parents to help them relax? Yeah, so we translate this into Spanish, but it, because it's the biggest population that we have. We have some Chinese, but most of, of them speak English. So the ones that we really realized that they didn't speak any word of English was the Spanish speakers. So it's the first step that we make, but probably we will think in translating to the other ones if we feel that there is like a need over there. Yeah, the one in front and then I'll get you out. Um, when, you, when you ship these, uh, these glasses to like other hospitals, does it come with, do you give advice on the processes and the resources that need to be put in place? Because it's one thing for another hospital to just receive the kit and another thing to really have it embed in the process to really use it and have optimal value from it. Absolutely, yeah. There's a there's a huge workflow involved of, of kind of implementing these types of tools. Uh, the first step is finding your champions, people like Molly, um, who are going to take over learning how to use this headset and like really be on, boots on the ground, like fitting it into the workflow. Um, and we also have a, a kind of written documentation booklet that gets people up and running on how to use all this stuff. Uh, we also travel, go into hospitals, spend a, a day with them, training them how to use the headsets and, and collaborating with them on how they might fit it into their workflows. So yeah, there's a fair amount of training. It's actually really a really important piece of it. Have you started going international? Uh, a little bit. <laughs> they start using projectors in Spain, in Barcelona. So right now, we are not like international yet. I'm hoping to bring this to Spain <laughs> because I was working there as a pediatric anesthesiologist. So I would like, I would love to give this to my 
all hospital and also now yeah and we are starting probably next week doing a partnership with a switzerland company so just little by little but just from the beginning u.s yeah there's nothing stopping this from being with only within the u.s the only thing is that like the language that you say so probably bring it to other continents you should just translate everything that is like quite an effort but we are happy if someone donate and support us we will do it Oh, yes, uh, since there is no medical treatment per se associated with this, I presume you're independent of the FDA? Yep, yep. we are in a nice little gray zone right now. Um, yeah, I'd say all people, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all people experimenting with this tech are, are just like winging it. Um, yeah, we're, we're outside of FDA. Since we're not using this as an actual treatment of any way, uh, it's more of like an entertainment device. Yeah. Um, so like there's charging. no... There's yeah. no charge to insurance or anything, so it's just like a distraction tool, but probably... Yeah, yeah. But we have been talking with some of the guys that work with the FDA, and probably they are going to be approved by the FDA, yeah. hopefully. So you also cannot build uh, insurance companies? Right? No. <laughs> so maybe maybe in a couple profit. decades. <laughs> yeah. Have you started addressing the deaf community or hearing here? That's a great question. Molly, do you have any experience with hearing impaired? Um, I would say at least the amount that come through the surgery center, there's not a large population through it, so not at this time. It would be a great thing to explore um, and figuring out how the best way is to adapt it for that. Um, yeah. 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 yeah, probably should be, it's, instead of like translation, should be like having something writing out so they don't yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because some of the instruction in this game sometimes we just talk a little bit at the beginning like I just choose your puppy and now we explain the game so maybe we just write down a little bit that one of our games the augmented reality that we just developed has everything writing down so it could be perfect for this kind of patient yeah, we, we try to make our game super intuitive so you can like just throw it on and start playing, uh, which is kind of nice, but absolutely, it's not really a population we've, we've started customizing stuff for. It, it, should, be, it is on the, it should be on the list. Cool.